Welcome back. This, this lesson will put us over the hump in Chapter 3, definitely. In fact, since we're not going to do 3.7, we've already gone over the hump with Section 4. In this one, we're going to look at some more applications, but this one's extra important because we're talking more about business optimization problems. The rest is sort of lead up, it's a foundation for what we're talking about, so you really need to know those things. So when I talk about something like uh, minimization or something, you know what I'm talking about. So we're going to hit a few items here today. And optimization. That means either make revenue better, or the best it can be, make the profit the best it can be, keep the cost low, lots of possibilities. We're going to just attack a couple of those things. So here's a model that someone's created for us. Someone in the business office, I guess, was good at calculus and statistics and whatever, and created this model for us. And the question is, with this model for the revenue, which I'm circling there, what production level would give us the maximum revenue? Remember, that's the money that's coming in. So first of all, I'm going to activate my pen here in case I want to use it. Here's a sketch of the revenue function. There's the actual revenue equation. Where am I? There. Right there. The cursor doesn't show up as well with the pen activated, but there we go. We can do it that way. There's our equation, and there's our graph of the equation. And you can get an idea of where the maximum is. And that's where the derivative, of course, equals zero. Critical point. So we start off with the primary equation, the one that the guy in the business office gave us. We've got to give that guy a raise. Since there's only one variable, you don't need a secondary equation. Remember in some of the other ones, we did need a secondary equation so we can get it down to one variable. Actually, it's two variables, but one independent variable in X. So the domain of the function, if you look at the graph, is from 0 to 546. So that's a little bit hard to tell, but you could check that out with some other skills that we've picked up along the way. To maximize it, you need to first find the derivative. I hope you don't mind that I'm not writing this out because you could always pause this video, try it yourself, make sure you're getting the same thing. It's good practice, guys. Good practice. So here's the revenue equation. You could write that as R of X. That's fine. Or just R. There's your derivative. Bring that three out front and so on. Once you've got the derivative, you set it equal to zero to get the critical numbers. Those will give you the place where that graph of the equation turns around, either from going up to going down or vice versa. Set it equal to zero, now comes the fun, the algebra part. Now there are ways of getting around this, and if you really want to know, we can we can talk about that, but you can factor it. That's the easiest way. If you notice that the leading term over here, let me just use the pen. The leading term over here is negative. That's always an indication when you're factoring to factor out the negative with any common factors. Make sure when you do that, when you factor out that negative 3, you add the x squared, and make sure you put that negative so that you get a positive 900x and negative there, and you're in business. So there are three factors. Set each one of them equal to 0, except for the negative 3. We know negative 3 is negative 3, not 0. So there you get 
two numbers mathematically, but only one is in the feasible domain. Remember the domain was 0 to 546. And negative 50 obviously isn't in the domain anyway. So from the graph you can see how it looks. There's the 350 units at the maximum. Remember also, just in case you may have let it slip, that when we're talking about a maximum, it's all about the y value. In this case, it's all about the r value or the revenue. Next, we're going to look at production levels on cost. And one way they do that is by looking at average, the average cost function. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you just look at the formula, you might get a pretty good guess. So here's my formula. Here's my average cost. Now, what does that mean? It means per item, how much does it cost to do the production? If you're creating 1,000 pens today, for example, what does it cost to make one of those pens? So you take the total cost, divide by how many you're actually making, and you get the cost per pen. It's the average cost function. Cost per unit. You might want to make the note to yourself. Cost per unit. Moving right along. They also no know that the total cost of producing X units is given by this model. Find the production level, the X in other words, that minimizes so we're going to look for critical numbers and the average cost per unit. So even if you've got the cost, that's not good enough. You have to take the cost, create your average cost function, which is C bar, and then you'll work from there. So C is the total cost. We need the average cost per unit. There's our primary equation. And substituting what we have earlier, this is the total cost function that our friends in the statistics department or somewhere gave us. Divide through by the x. That makes the whole thing a lot simpler. We don't have the quotient rule staring us in the face. You would probably also make that 800 times x to the negative 1 because you know you're taking the derivatives coming up. Feasible domain is x greater than 0 because you can't produce a negative number of units, obviously. So, we'll find the derivative, and that was pretty simple. Remember that middle term was a constant, so the derivative of that one was zero. So we have two terms left. There's our derivative of the average cost function. To get the critical numbers, you set that equal to zero. Critical numbers, set the derivative equal to zero. And a little bit of algebra. Add the 800 over x squared both sides. Here's what we've got. And multiply by x squared. Looks better. Do a little bit of a division. And you've got x squared. That looks better. Take the square root of that. Remember, you've got two answers. Plus or minus 2,000. However, can we have a demand of negative 2,000? Let's hope not. Can sketch that graph that gives you a nice picture of where 
the average cost minimization goes. Now we get to something really interesting for some people. This is right on the edge of what I understand. If you'd like a total understanding of what price elasticity of demand is, your best bet is go down the stairs or on this floor, sorry, in the Olin building there in on the first floor, anyway, it, it says accounting up front. Go to that department, ask them about the price, price elasticity of demand. But I can tell you a little bit, so here we go. So this is the way economists measure the responsiveness to a change in the price. So we get a little bit greedy perhaps and increase the price or maybe we get get nice about things and we drop the price because we're selling so many we're going to see if we can even throw up the demand even further. Well what happens this this says what happens when we change the price. That's what the price elasticity of demand represents. For example, dropping the price of fresh tomatoes. So think of the sub that I'm having this morning from Publix. Will those fresh tomatoes, if you drop the price, make them cheaper this morning? What's going to happen to the demand? Will the demand go up because the price is down or will it go down? Such a demand, if it goes, if a drop, where am I here? Here we are. If you have a drop in the price and the demand goes up, your demand is elastic. In other words, they're in inverse relation with each other. <clears throat> one goes up, the other goes down, and vice versa. That means you've got an elastic demand. On the other hand, there are some things that even if you change the price, you still have the same demand. For example, well, for me, gasoline makes sense because I'm not a coffee drinker. Even if someone raises the price of gasoline, can I stop buying it or can I buy less? Well, I still have to get to work. I still have to go on vacation or whatever I want to do. I still have to buy the gasoline. I don't have a choice. If you need the coffee to get you started in the morning, then that might be a non-negotiable item as well. Even if they raise the price on the coffee, your favorite coffee, you might buy it anyway. And that's an inelastic demand. Now, we get to the math of it, since we are in a math class anyway. Elasticity of, of demand is the percent of a quantity demanded by the percent of its price. Another way of putting that is as the price changes how does the demand change? In calculus terms which means almost the same thing dp dx. One small reminder Delta P is the exact change of the price. Delta X is the exact change of the price when you go from one to the other. Over here, this DP DX is an approximation using calculus. Most times, that's going to be enough for what we need. But it isn't exactly the same. It's approximately the same. So, using that approximation, 
the one up here. This is what you can write. The price elasticity of demand. Rate of change. Notice these are both rates. Rate of change in the demand or the rate of change of the price. Here's three ways of writing that. The last one is convenient because it involves derivatives and they're easier to figure out than actually doing the subtraction and getting these values. So here is a definition. Now let's see, does this actually say it? Yes. This is the Greek letter eta. <coughs> Excuse me, it's a lowercase eta. Don't ask me offhand what the uppercase is. You can check that out for yourself if you really care. The price elasticity of demand. That's where you're going to work with for just a little bit here. And that's the price, the unit price over the demand divided by how it's changing. I've got a couple of graphics coming up. It's elastic. When that eta, the absolute value of eta is greater than one. So if it's over one or over less than negative one, then it's elastic. It's inelastic if the absolute value is less than one. In other words, it's between one and negative one. And it's unit elasticity. Of course, unit means one. If eta has the absolute value of one. In other words, one or negative one. <clears throat> so here's what I added. They had a nice graphic and a nice rectangle here. So I put some things together. So this means that the price is a function of x. This is the also known as the demand function, remember? And this is how it's defined. And here are the three things to remember. Eta, that's the elasticity. If it's greater than one, it's elastic. That means if the price goes up, the demand goes down and vice versa. If it's, be, if it's less than one, the absolute value is less than one, it's inelastic. And if it's equal to one, unit elasticity. Here's a picture of a revenue curve. Elastic values on the left. Inelastic on the right. So depending on how much money is coming in, your elasticity will change. So if it's elastic, if you drop the price, you sell more. If it's inelastic, you drop the price and you get an increase in unit sales. Oh, sorry. Decrease. I thought there was something strange here. You have to remember this knot here. You decrease the price like in the last one, but you don't get an increase in sales. Enough to increase the total revenue. Sorry. Example number five. First one for elasticity elasticity for us. So someone has put together a demand function for us. That's pretty nice. And also told us what the domain is. 
Here's our demand function. There's our unit price. There's our demand right there. And our demand goes from 0 to 144 for some reason or another. P is the price per unit. X is the number of units. So remember what I suggested a while ago. Think of some kind of business. Just make up something. What's your favorite thing to buy? Maybe it's an item of clothing. Maybe it's pens or sh shoes. Hey, my son is crazy about shoes, or at least used to be before the baby was born. I don't know how many shoes he had. He wasn't, on, wasn't in the house anymore, but he bought lots of shoes. Some people are big on shoes. So maybe you want to think of in terms of selling shoes. So we want to find two things. First of all, when the demand has those three properties, elastic, inelastic, unit elasticity. Remember this one means eta is greater than one. This one means eta, excuse my etas, are less than one. And unit elasticity means eta. That's what value is exactly one. And then describe the behavior. So here's the basic formula. So what we need is P and X and DP DX. So we'll put those in. So we already had some of these pieces. Here's our P on top. Here's our demand X on the bottom. And this is the derivative of what's on the top. Put those together as a quotient and a little bit of cleanup. Notice that in this formula up here that we started with, you've got a complex fraction. That's not really great. One way of cleaning this up, and it's not the only way, is if you multiply top and bottom by minus square root of x. That's the way this person has done it. It's one nice way of doing it. Once you do that, you end up with this. You might want to go back there and work through this yourself. Good practice. There it is after we've cleaned it up a bit. Split those up by dividing both sides or dividing both of the terms in the numerator by the x. Remember, that's like the distributive property. You can't just divide the x into the first or the second one. That would be too easy for one thing, and it would be incorrect. So, let's start with the easy one. The demand of unit elasticity is when the absolute value of eta is 1. So, set it equal to 1. Now, what you probably would do would be to write this twice. You would write, just to get you started, this is the absolute value of this expression equals 1. There are two ways that can happen. You could get that if what's inside here is a 1. Simple. But if what's inside is a negative 1, you also get a 1 for an absolute value. So, just as a reminder, I might need a reminder too, is so negative 24 square root of x over x plus 2 equals 1 is one equation. You also have negative 24 square root of x over x plus 2 equals negative 1. 
Remembering also that your x's can't be negative. So, so you come up with the 64. I'll leave that for you to do. So the demand is unit elasticity has unit elasticity when x equals 64. Next, elastic. How about elastic? That's when the absolute value of 8 is greater than 1. Up here. There we go. Absolute value of 8 is greater than 1. So that's elastic. And you can do the work. And what you get is x is between 0 and 64. That's when the demand is elastic. That means when you decrease the price, the demand goes up and vice versa. For the other situation, oops, this should be inelastic. I need to fix this. Slide 51. Sorry, just want to make a note so I don't forget that. All right. There's the graph of your equation, and you can see that the revenue is increasing up to 64, and decreasing after 64 due to the number of units going up the demand is going down in some which changes the revenue and last of all just some business terms I would suggest that if you don't know these automatically or by now although you should most of them Maybe you'd want to print this one out. One in particular that you might not be very comfortable would be the average cost per unit function. And of course the unit elasticity. I really doubt anyone is familiar with yet. Remember, P over X over the derivative. Of P over X. Marginal revenue, marginal cost, marginal profit. Remember, if you run into a problem that says marginal average profit or any average, you have to take one of these and convert it to the average. That's a good one to print out if you don't already know all of them. If you know almost all of them, except for those two, maybe you can focus on those for a couple of days and you, you'll get those under your belt too. There are some graphs that you might want to look at. There's the demand function as the price decreases. So someone's being either nice or they have to close the price out. Maybe you're closing out those shoes that you're selling. So you want to reduce the price so more people, yeah, because that's the demand, so more people buy them. Decrease the price, more people buy it. If it's elastic. In elastic, the opposite story. and the cost function and the profit function. Notice this tells a little bit of a story if you take a moment to think about it. These are the costs. So this is the demand. So the more items you have, more shoes you have, of course, it's going to cost you more money to get those shoes in your store. Of course. So the cost goes up. 
But even if you don't have any shoes, there's a certain cost that you're going to have to pay anyway. No shoes in the store, you still have to pay for the rent, the lighting, the heat, and so on. Fixed cost. Start somewhere, unless someone's giving you space for your business, it's going to start somewhere with the fixed costs. The break even point. One way of thinking of that is revenue equals cost. Another one is profit equals zero. Or another way is revenue minus cost equals zero because these two are the same thing. Profit and revenue minus cost are the same thing. All right, I think that's enough for 3.5. And pretty soon we're going to look at 3.6. We're going to skip over 3.7 because I doubt that doing curve analysis is that important for business people. And if you ever needed it, you could always come back anyway. So next step is going to be 3.6. About asymptotes. And we're going to, going to go to 3.8. And then we'll jump into 4 after a test. Well, it's been good talking with you. Hope to see you soon.